Welcome to Siren Coffee and Science. I am Dr. Tamara Cadet, and I'm an associate professor at the Simmons School of Social Work and faculty at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine and Oral Health Policy and Epidemiology. Today's conversation wraps up the coffee and science events on topics related to assistance. Just as a reminder, assistance refers to the healthcare sector activities that aim to reduce social risk by providing or linking patients with relevant social services. The National Academies of Sciences and Engineering and Medicine, NASM, um, the committee member, Robin Golden, was slated, to be, was slated to be today's moderator, but Robin had an unexpected conflict and I feel honored and lucky to be able to fill in for her, though I can never be her, and consider it a real privilege today to talk with Bonnie Ewald, the Associate Director of the Center for Health and Social Care Integration and Program Manager of Strategic Development and Policy for, for Rush University Medical Center Social Work and Community Health Department. For the next half hour, Bonnie and I get to explore how the pandemic contributed to increases in telesocial care, the facilitators and barriers of that shift, and opportunities for expanding telesocial care delivery and what we very much hope is a non-pandemic dictated future. So before we get started, I just wanna share a couple of logistics. Um, we welcome you to submit your questions via the Zoom Q&A feature. We've also activated the upvote and comment features on the Q&A and invite you to interact with others who are in this session. In the past, there have been some great conversations and great discussions occurring between audience members. So let's keep that going today. We would love to sort of see them. And as a reminder, today's conversation is being recorded and will be released as a podcast in about a week. So here we go, Bonnie. I'd like us to talk a little bit about assistance activities in general. There are so many interventions that assistance entails. Can you talk with us a little bit about some examples of these and how does your work over the years at Rush relate to this? Yeah, thanks, Tammy. And big thanks to the SIREN team for kind of slotting this topic in. Um, of course, telesocial care specifically has been um, hugely important, something we've all been engaging in in the last 15, 16 months because of the pandemic. But we also know that telesocial care has been happening from different players across the country for years. So I'll speak a little bit to our, our work uh, doing that at Rush, but um, big picture, you know, this whole kind of uh, part of this coffee and science series is focused on assistance. And we know that assistance can mean a lot of things. It can be kind of lighter touch, providing a list of resources or kind of a one-time touch base to reinforce some, getting uh, someone connected with um, a, a resource that might address a need uh, that they reported. But it can also be more in depth that kind of is following them with time, building relationships um, and really trying to explore complexities and mitigate the impact of those, including uh, social needs on their ultimate health and well-being. Um, so again, it could be, you know, range from providing information on enrolling in a benefit, uh, texting people a list of relevant resources in their zip code. Um, it could be contact tracing. A lot of us have been doing contact tracing in the last year, both, you know, to try to um, prevent the spread of COVID, but also to help people be able to quarantine. And we know that in order to be able to quarantine and self-isolate, you have to make, have your social needs met so you can safely be at home. Right. Um, so there's a huge social care component to contact tracing. Uh, we also have seen a, a huge uh, increase in isolation and loneliness kind of brought on by the pandemic. And so there's a lot of kind of telesocial care and assistance opportunities there. Um, really quick, I'll just mention, at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago and through our work nationally with Chassis, uh, we've focused since 2007 on uh, social work led care management initiatives that have a really strong telephonic component. So following up with folks after they discharge from the hospital, uh, again, largely telephonically, we would try to meet them at the bedside to initiate the relationship, but really doing telephonic touch points to leverage some of the the efficiencies and the benefits that can come from telephonic 
wraparound care in addition to in-person medical care. Um, and I know we'll talk a little bit more in the next 20 minutes or so about some of the benefits and challenges of telephonic care. But a lot of the, I guess, comments that I'm bringing to the table today are based on our, our care management work that's really a little bit on the the side of more in-depth interventions. And Tammy, I know as a social worker, something that you've you've thought about and researched a lot about as well. Thank you. I just have a, a quick follow-up question. I, it made me think, or maybe it's a comment, it made me think that, you know, if, if you all at Rush have been doing this work, you know, it, it, I'm going to make an assumption, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that it wasn't actually difficult to sort of switch to do some of this telesocial care because you've done it in-depthly through the care management program. Um, and I wonder were there various levels sort of during COVID and, and now, because we're not quite done with it, um, where you did sort of the lighter touch assistance versus the in-depth assistance that you're typically doing? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Definitely, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, we really um, scaled back on the depth of our assessment because mm -hmm. at the beginning, our social work team at Rush, as an example, was calling, was trying to call every COVID positive patient. Um, and so, and Rush saw a good percentage of folks who tested positive in Chicago. So that was a really big list. And so in order to, we had to adjust caseload expectations. Um, and so what had been in a really, a pretty in-depth assessment that sometimes could take 45 minutes to an hour, a comprehensive conversation-based assessment, in addition to some kind of concrete uh, social needs screening questions, we had, we pared that down to a list of 10 things and we kind of prioritized what do we want to, what do we need to make sure we're asking about, including loneliness and isolation, including advanced directives, things that are particularly relevant during the pandemic. And if people are COVID positive, positive, excuse me, as one example. When you're finding this out, you know, we, we have seen this in the research. We've been in many, many discussions about, okay, well, we find somebody's lonely. Um, we assess their needs. What do we do? And what do we do in particular during COVID when there were sort of less things available for folks? Um, at least that was my experience when I was working with some folks, you know, over the past year and a half. Yeah, well, and I think that um, that issue brings up that any assistance initiatives really need to make sure that we are finding relevant interventions to connect people to. So assistance can be the actual, a friendly caller initiative to address isolation, but assistance is also linking people to that and making sure that the initiative that we connect them to is working for them. Um, so again, just speaking to our example at Rush um, as one kind of case study for folks to think about is we built out a friendly caller initiative leveraging volunteers from the west side of the city, leveraging students, lever leveraging AmeriCorps members. Um, and again, just as one example, making Absolutely. sure that any need that you're identifying, that you're engaging or building out an appropriate response to be able to address those needs, you know, and that goes for any need, not just isolation and loneliness. Right. That is, that's incredible. That's a great example. I had wondered, I had not heard of that in, in sort of Boston, not that it's not happening, but I often wondered, you know, can't we just have sort of, we don't need sort of licensed social workers. Um, we could have community health workers, we have volunteers do it. So um, that's great. So um, I know that um, Chassie rec recently partnered with the National Center for Complex Health and Social Needs to create a guide on tele-social care. And I know you worked with social workers and nurses from both organizations, yours and theirs, to tease out some key learnings. Um, can you tell me some of the benefits and some of the not so good benefits of implementing social care um, telephonically or virtually um, that you saw, that you heard about um, compared with in-person? And I know there are lots of issues around this, so um, this is going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And thank you, Yuri, for just pasting the link to our guide into the chat. So we co-produced this with the National Center, which is based at the Camden Coalition for Healthcare Providers out in New Jersey, um, and really trying to learn from our frontline providers of kind of, you know, on the rush side, we've been doing telephonic work right. for a decade, over a decade. And at Camden, they have a model that's really grounded in in-person connections and building in-person relationships. And so they had to pivot really quickly quickly. And so with this guide, we tried to tease out lessons from both of those implementation approaches. So it's all detailed there, but a couple of things just to name, and I'm sure folks on the line have observed this in their own work, is 
there are some benefits to telephonic or virtual delivery. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people who are really busy, caregivers, people working a couple of jobs, um, just a lot of us prefer to minimize how much we have to show up at a given point or at a given a specific time, you know, so if we can have that be a phone call or a, a video chat, um, that it's just easier. Um, or if we live far from the clinic, kind of reducing transportation barriers. So there's um, some benefits there. There's efficiencies to be gained, not, you know, if an initiative used to perform home visits, not having to do the transportation to the home, both time and financial efficiencies. Um, there's also some benefits to, and I think maybe a lot of us have experienced this personally, to like video chatting and telephone and phone conversations also kind of have this strange sense of intimacy that you wouldn't necessarily yes. expect. Of course, yes. we're missing out on some of the in-person cues, right. but um, there's also this, this kind of a, a benefit in a sense. And actually one study from a few years ago um, and we'll make sure uh, that Yuri has this to add into the show notes, found that um, studying folks who are just doing telephonic conversations, mm -hmm. the interviewer could be more attuned to the uh, individual's emotions than if they also had a visual uh, component to it. And so they, the, uh, the researchers deduced that kind of just being able to hone in on the sound really, it was like less distracting and it helped the people on the phone call kind of be more attuned to people's emotions. So I think in that sense, there, there are these kind of upsides to, to telephonic interventions is that you have to kind of be more present as a clinician or as a community health worker in that Absolutely. intervention. Yeah, so that I, there's a lot of really interesting, like re more research questions mm -hmm. that I think we as a field could dig into with that. Um, but the flip side of all of those benefits, of course, have some challenges too. Um, we all know that in order to be able to maintain these engagements, you need to have a reliable working phone that doesn't run out of minutes at the end of the month. You need to have uh, working Wi-Fi. You need to have a device to access the Wi-Fi right. <laughs> with that device. Um, we also know, especially um, if we're working with populations with particularly complex care needs, it can right. just be hard. challenging to build rapport and assess, uh -huh. yeah, just uh -huh. hard to um, kind of fully understand the complexity of those needs. Um, yeah. We also know, again, I'm sure we've all done this, that if you're just on the phone with someone, you might be multitasking, whereas if you're in a person <laughs> clinic, you're, you're there, you know, so but, um, some therapists on our team kind of say, oh, I think the client I was working with might have been in the grocery store during that session. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Challenges there, but then also that's can bring some more insight to your relationship too, if you kind of can recognize a name like, oh, you know, I see that you're juggling a lot. Um, right. You know, can we have a conversation about time management or, you know, there's different directions you can take with that. Um, so, and there's, there's more kind of benefits and drawbacks named in the brief, but those are some of the big ones that come to mind. Right. It reminds me of um, someone I saw who said who I was I was doing telephone work during the pandemic, and they were like, "Miss, I can't hear you," and I'm literally feeling like I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. And, and this was an older person who was hard of hearing. And finally, he just said, "You know what? If you can't come see me and do this in person, then I can't do this right now." And it was it broke my heart on one level, and on the other hand, I was like, "Well, at least this person is very clear." about what they need um, and, you know, and I can figure out how to get permission to sort of visit um, during this time. But, um, you know, I do think, it, I agree with you. I, I love all of the accessibility that it potentially offers to, to some populations and then recognize for other populations that there are a number of challenges to make it happen and makes it really hard. And, and, or, you know, someone who's like, I think I'm talking to the doctor, but I have no idea what they just said. Um, and, and, you know, and I know the, the brief talks about sort of cues and, and all of that. And I do feel like you do have to, you have to, you have to be more present than maybe we are in person because you get to see stuff, but I do think it's um, really good. Um, so I just, um, I'm going to pay attention, make sure there's no Q&A. Um, it looks questions. like we got a couple. While you're reading those, I just want to add, you know, the point you just made is an, just a nice nod to 
even if we're having telephonic interactions as kind of the main mode of our assistance activities, that doesn't mean we can't reinforce with a MyChart message, a text message, a snail mail letter with you know, health information or whatever we might be engaging with someone around um, to kind of make sure that we're meeting their um, kind of their learning style and to make sure that information is accessible. Yes, I agree. Um, so um, there's a question about how these types of assistant programs are funded. Are the social workers licensed and billing third parties for their case management services, or are these programs delivered at a cost open, at a cost open, I'm not sure, at a cost that demonstrate overall cost savings? Yeah. Um, typically, unfortunately, there, um, there are not direct billing opportunities. Um, Medicare, and the last page of the issue brief that Yuri pasted into the chat details this a little mm -hmm. bit more. Um, but there aren't direct billing opportunities for social workers, even if this work was done in person, the opportunities are really limited. Um, so most programs are grant funded. There are of course opportunities. I think those of us on this webinar really believe in the long-term value and preventive nature of this work in reducing long-term health costs. And we've seen that through a lot of different studies different interventions, including our work through Chassis, um, you know, reducing visits to the emergency department as an example. Um, however, making a um, causal case of the impact of one specific assistance activity is really tricky because when we're talking about kind of this broad like resource navigation, it's hard to say, was it the actual food that got delivered to someone? Was it the utility assistance? Was it the trusting relationship that I, as the navigator or the care manager developed with them? Was it that they now believe that their primary care provider um, kind of really is, has a, is trustworthy because they referred them to this helpful right. initiative? So there's so many things that could this, be yes. that, yeah, so I think that's another kind of research thing that the field needs to keep working on, both for in-person and, te and telesocial care activities. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I, I know we're going to talk about this towards the end, but yeah, you started to talk about sort of the research that's needed um, and sort of separating out sort of to the extent that we can as researchers, you know, what part of the intervention is working um, is certainly something we discovered in our NASA report um, findings and all of that. Um, and then to the second question, which I find very interesting and thinking about it as I was looking at it. Um, do we have any thoughts on the pilot study by Dr. Pam de Guzman, who's a professor and researcher at um, the University of Virginia, who's working with libraries now to start a pilot program for some libraries to become telehealth hubs. Um, and I'd like, so first of all, libraries are in the community libraries are accessible. Um, and um, for me, any if, if we have a population of folks that are coming into libraries that we may not get in the other place, then I'm all about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I actually don't know specifics about that pilot, but the general notion, of course, is wonderful, kind of this idea of making telehealth uh, access a little bit, hopefully a little bit easier for people to engage in. Um, and also pairing that with all the other benefits of socialization and access to other information and kind of personal learning that people get from libraries. So I think that's great opportunities for touch points. We know that libraries are increasingly getting peer navigators and social workers Absolutely. based in them. Um, yep. So I think that's really cool. And also just big picture. Um, we, as a country, have had a lot of telehealth flexibilities in place because of the pandemic and mm -hmm. they'll be in place under Medicare through the end of the public health emergency, likely through the end of 2021. But Congress is working on whether to extend that for a couple more years to keep oh. studying if we want telehealth flexibilities to be in place for people even without geographic restrictions before you had to kind of prove that you were essentially lived in a rural area and then people couldn't access it from home. They had to go into like a centralized hub. Right. Uh, but they're looking at should, can we make it open for everyone again to mm -hmm. increase accessibility for those family caregivers as an example, who are just really busy and might not be able to get in. Um, so those, there's a couple bills um, being 
kind of shopped around in both the Senate and the House right now. So hopefully we'll learn more about kind of general telehealth um, continuing benefits through Medicare. Again, that's kind of for medical care, not social care, because uh, social care is it's not covered. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of challenges with getting it reimbursed in the first place. There certainly is. You said it and you knew where I was going to go. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking we've talked about the benefits for patients around telesocial care. Um, and we started to get a little bit into sort of the clinician or the practitioner role um, and sort of are there best practices um, that we just want to highlight? I know there's a ton in the brief, but pra best practices we want to highlight um, to make sure the assistance that we're offering as clinicians and and practitioners is effective and person-centered as possible. Yeah, thank you for that question. And um, you know, some of those, some of the things that come to mind for, at first are like logistical. Like, as providers, many of us have been working from home mm -hmm. as we implement these telesocial care initiatives. So, like, we're dealing with different work laptops. We're trying, or maybe even on our personal mm -hmm. computers, right. we're trying to use. BDI is to remote in and it's slower and it's hard to access our electronic health record. Um, we are using our personal cell phones and using like star six, seven or Google voice. And how does that show up on a patient's phone? They might not recognize that in our case, someone's calling from rush. So they'll probably be less likely to pick up, especially with the huge increase in spam calls that we're all getting. These Absolutely. Days. Um, so that's something that we've literally been working on for since the beginning of the pandemic at Rush is how to have it so that our workforce calling from home can have their work number associated with their phone call. So there's like that logistical piece. There's, um, you know, if someone's referring, I alluded earlier to the idea that some a member of a primary care team conducts a screening for social needs, someone reports a need and then gets referred to an example, care management or navigation initiative. In that case, it's super helpful if the primary care provider or another member of the team can have a conversation with the patient about, you know, I'm so glad that you let us know that this is, an, you know, something that we might be able to help address in your life. I have a colleague, Bonnie, who I'm going to have give you a call. You know, she does this day in and day out. And um, so you can look out for a call from her. And I really hope that you'll you know, engage with her. And if you have any issues, let me know. That kind of warm handoff um, right. can really, really help and make it easier than when I, as a, as the care manager call, Just, it's not quite as uh, much of a cold call. Um, I yeah. I was going to say, I do wonder, you know, one of the things that I have found helpful if I can, if, I, if it's possible is to give the number because of sort of all the issues with spam. So, you know, Bonnie Ewald will call and this is the number, at least these are the first, you know, if you're in Chicago, the same thing, these are the first three digits after the area code so that they at least recognize, particularly if it's not coming up um, as a rush call. Yeah, I know that's a great, a great tip. Um, just another kind of realm of things that are really important for programs to kind of have plans in place and individual clinicians to is, um, kind of what what to do in case of uh, like like a risk assessment and follow up yes. plan. Yes. So in yes. case of mm -hmm. worst case scenario suicidality or something short of that, um, being really familiar with how to do a three way call with nine one one or with a mental health clinician on your team to engage them on the call. So having a plan before you go in on crisis management. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important really again, important. we're not face to face and kind of, you know, the deep, the brief details, um, this notion of trying to get collateral information. If we, if we do based on someone's health record, for instance, have a sense that someone might be um, more likely to be at risk for a mental health crisis. So when we're starting out that phone call, um, you know, asking for a phone number that we can call them back on if we happen to drop them, like do, do they happen to have anyone at home with them that we could connect with if we lose their, if we lose them on the phone, um, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. And then just kind of relate, this isn't in, in the realm of crisis management, but another kind of prep detail is if we're speaking with folks who have a different first language and we're gonna be using interpreter yes. services, those can be tricky to use Very over the tricky. phone. And so practicing <laughs> as much as we can and having like giving that um, the interpreter a heads up about kind of 
which is, you know, big picture, but the goal of the call, if we have to leave a voicemail, here's what we want to say. Some of those logistics um, can make the whole initiative a lot smoother as well. And can make the patient feel like they've been supported um, or the client be supported and all of that. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the driving questions around research and evaluation? I know we started to get at it a little bit with the first question that we got asked. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things that we need to keep studying and learning. I think, um, you know, we talked about how some populations might have increased access to care through this, through telephonic and virtual delivery, but other populations, folks who are hard of hearing, as the example you brought up, might have decreased access to care. So kind of honing in on that question and naming what populations and kind of mm -hmm. what care scenarios benefit from telesocial care and what hurt. And in cases where populations um, have decreased access, what can we do to maintain access and kind of what are the, the time and resource investments that are needed, um, you know, such as providing tablet and paying for people's internet bills as an example. Right. Um, yeah. I think too, and this is broadly with assistance activities in general, but including telesocial care is this notion of dosage. And like, you know, we talked about lighter touch and more in-depth assistance. Yeah. So with what populations is a weekly touch point really warranted? With what populations is that hour long assessment really needed and right. helpful in teasing out complexities versus a five or a 10 question screening tool? Um, and then of course the cost yeah. savings or cost effectiveness yeah, available too. Yeah. Yeah, and that's all, you know, with, and then what can be done telephonically versus when are home visits or clinic visits really, um, when do they have good bang for their buck in terms right. of our, our investments? Because again, we're all operating, unfortunately, um, generally on shoestring budgets and grant mm -hmm. funds that we're trying to stretch as far as we can. So trying to be as effective as we can. Um, lots, lots more questions, of course, to research. Um, is like the, the workforce, the skill set um, that's needed. And this is something else that I know you care a lot about, Tammy, yes. and that the <laughs> NASM committee dug into a little bit is, you know, when when is a um, is it best to pair a community health worker and someone with with trusted and kind of deep ties with, yes. with someone? When is it good to engage someone with a lot of trauma training or a mental health background, such as a social worker? When is a community health nurse to kind of provide health education along with um, an intervention? When should they take the lead? Some of those questions um, I think are really interesting and would be, again, lots of research that could be done. Absolutely, I think we have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, I, I walked out of the NASM committee meeting feeling there just needs to be a ton of research around social care in general, around how we deliver the interventions, who we deliver them to, measuring the dosages you talked about, um, and who, who does the work, and, and making sure that we're clear about the team is effective and are there particular effective, or are there particular um, folks that are effective in one area versus the other, and how do we begin to sort of identify that from um, an empirical um, basis? So, um, well, I think we are just about at the end of our time. Um, and I just wanna thank you, Bonnie. It was so much fun uh, to spend some time with you. I always get to talk with you, but never to get to speak with you um, on your insights. And I thank everybody for joining us today. Coffee and Science is going on a short summer break, but they'll be back on July the 16th to, go, to kick off a new series of conversations about healthcare activities that adjust clinical care to accommodate patients' social conditions, starting with Drs. Danielle Hessler-Jones and, doc, and Ra doctors, Dr. Rachel Gold, who will explore opportunities to use clinical decision support tools to contextualize care. We look forward to seeing you on July 16th.